Ms. Sofia Toscano, thank you so much for taking the time for this interview. And first, I'd like you to introduce yourself to uh, the, the viewers who may not know what you're doing in the, that part of the world. So tell us about uh, tell us about yourself. Yes, my name is Sophie Madens Toscano. I'm a Belgian lawyer. I've been recruited as expert by ITU to uh, assist in offering the module on school connectivity. Mm. It is a module that we did. Um, there are two distinct aspects of it. One is the one laptop per child. The other are the legal and regulatory issues related to school connectivity. Mm. That uh, toolkit is available as from today. Uh, on the ITU website and contains many best practices, case studies mm -hmm. and lessons in how school connectivity can benefit countries, communities, schools mm -hmm. and of course our children. Okay, so your session was about discussing that module and what are the main elements of it without going into much details, but for those who have not heard about the module, what key elements uh, are there in it? Well, when you're looking at a school connectivity plan, and in the session we had today, we also had the gentleman from Egypt that was talking about how in Egypt they achieved school connectivity. Mm. The key point is that one must look at it holistically, one must look at a global approach and see school connectivity, mm. schools and connectivity. Therefore, you need to look at ICT policies and laws. Mm. You need to set a realistic timetable. Mm. You need to look at funding. You need to see who the stakeholders were, are going to be and what they're prepared to contribute. Mm. But then you also need to prioritize what schools are you going to connect. Mm. Can it be a top-down? So is it the centralized agency that will decide what schools to connect? Mm. Or does it come from the schools themselves that request connectivity? Mm. Then you also need to look at the um, network details, so what technology will you use to achieve the school connectivity and you cannot forget the support mechanisms as well. Mm. You must look at maintenance, you must look at sustainability of the project. Mm. And finally you have to have an entity in place that looks at coordination, um, monitoring and evaluation as we saw from the case of Morocco, which was presented today as well, evaluation and looking at what has been achieved and how can it be improved is a key element to school connectivity plans. Mm -hmm. So those are the key elements that one needs to look at. So the major part of your discussion was on why do we need national school connectivity plans. So why do you think these are important things to have? Well, we need a national school connectivity plans, first of all, because you cannot underestimate the importance of connectivity in schools in, in terms of improving the way uh, of education, mm -hmm. in terms of access to information from around the globe, in terms as well as of administration of the various schools and also to use the schools as anchors for community connectivity mm. because even in the rural areas you will see that schools are often seen as a place where children feel safe but where other people feel safe going to. So if you mm. can use that as anchors for connectivity including for other groups with special needs such as people with disabilities, women and girls, etc. Mm -hmm. So how does, when you said when you talked about the module, you said that you came across several approaches that other countries have taken. So what are the approaches that have been done before and what is your view on them? Well, we've seen the successful approaches and we had a couple of um, presentations on that today. The successful approach is really where there has been a global approach, where there has been coordination between mm. the Ministry of Education, so the education plans and the, and the connectivity plans. Mm. The successful approach has also been where there has been regular review where stakeholders have been brought in appropriately mm. and where the financing has been assured. Mm. But the successful approach as well, if I look at a country like Portugal that today is aiming for one laptop for every child in the schools, mm. is because since 1998 Portugal has looked at school connectivity as a, gl a global part of their ICT policy. Mm. They've involved the telecommunications regulator, they've involved the education mm. entities, mm. and they've looked at it, they've brought it into their licensing approach in telecommunications, they've brought it in the, into their license evaluation approach in telecommunications, they've brought it into their universal service obligations, and they've brought it into cooperation between government and 
and private entities mm. such as the uh, Intel, we, we see the One Laptop Per uh -huh. Child initiative generally. Mm. In Portugal, that One Laptop Per Child in initiative is called Magalhães, and mm. that is where they have uh, brought together telecoms operators with stakeholders with government mm. and what they're what what Portugal is doing as well is not just looking at the equipment but also looking at the content that is all part and parcel mm. of their policy so what are what are the examples we've seen in the module you can see examples from around the world from Latin America from Africa from mm -hmm. Europe but what you've seen in the more successful examples is where the approach is very it has been well coordinated well thought out and mm. well implemented uh -huh. So how do you think school connectivity can change the way children learn and the way schools can be administered? The way in which children learn, I think there you have the opening up of the whole world towards children. And yes, you might, you might say, well, are we not concerned in, in the type of information that children will have accessible to them? Mm. There, I think that is part of the planning that you need. You need to look at your cybersecurity laws mm -hmm. and you need to, again in that holistic approach when you evaluate the IC policies and legislations you mm -hmm. need to look at those laws and see that the appropriate laws are in place so that um, inappropriate content cannot be easily made available to children. Mm -hmm. Now if we look at how can they benefit from it, well if the, our children have the benefit of researching on the internet, looking at case of country examples, looking at explanations of mathematics problems, looking at reading things in English that prior previously mm. or in French or any other language that they wish to learn that prior previously we would have to go to bookshops mm. and buy the books and there was always a delay in our in our learning capabilities or mm -hmm. our willingness, they now have the chance of getting to that more easily. Mm -hmm. Now in terms of the administration of the school, mm -hmm. I think there it's a question of uh, First of all, the optimization of the processes and the procedures. Mm. And also, secondly, um, more transparency, more openness. There's more opportunity for parents to get involved in the school administration. Yeah, I, for one, uh, I live in the United States, and, for, and my, my child's uh, grades are available online. Mm -hmm. Any announcements from the schools are available online, but also the annual report from the mm -hmm. school is available. So, the administration of the school in terms of financing, management, but also in the transparency towards the parents gets mm. facilitated by okay. that kind of activity. Okay, so when we talk about school connectivity, who are the real stakeholders? Is it just government, is it NGOs, or is it a mix of both? How do you see the stakeholders in that area? The stakeholders are a mix of a, a number of stakeholders. You have government authorities in the first place, obviously, we're talking about school and connectivity, uh -huh. so you would have education entities and ICT mm -hmm. agencies. But then other stakeholders can be, or those contributing to the process can be equipment manufacturers, can be telecommunications operators, mm. can be NGOs, can be international donor agencies, can mm. be other government entities that have an interest in school or in connectivity and bringing that connectivity to other communities. Mm. So you have a wide variety of stakeholders that should be brought in, consumer organizations as mm. well, mm. that should be brought into the process in determining school connectivity. Okay, we're really interested to know about Portugal's uh, um, the, the licensing uh, uh, experience that it went through and how it impacted uh, school connectivity in particular. As I, as I mentioned uh, earlier on in the interview, Portugal has had a very comprehensive approach to school connectivity since the 1990s. What happened was that Portugal, at the end of the 90s, was chairing the, the European Council, so had the presidency of the European Union. Their main, their key point in their presidency was the Information Society in Europe, and they promoted that in Europe initiative within within their presidency. Now, that was just at the time that the three G licenses were being granted in many countries in Europe. And what you were seeing is that in Germany and the UK in particular, you had these huge auctions bringing in tremendous amounts of money. Mm -hmm. Now. Government in Portugal had a study carried out to look at the impact of high licensing fees and how such high licensing fees would impact 
the rollout of 3G and the cost for consumers. Mm -hmm. But also they brought in this, how can we promote the information society mm -hmm. in this process. So rather than asking for huge licensing fees, what happened was that 50% of the evaluation criteria for the 3G licenses mm -hmm. were uh, based on innovative information society projects. Operators mm -hmm. had to come up with innovative information society projects mm -hmm. and were evaluated on that for their 3G licensing. Mm -hmm. And School Connectivity was part and parcel of that. Mm -hmm. Some of the operators came up with School Connectivity mm -hmm. projects within their content. Now, next to that, of course, government continued with their e-policy and with their e-policy continued to provide that connectivity to schools. What happened is that part of the license fees were also put into a special fund. An agreement was made between government and Intel mm. so that that special fund could then be used within the context of the one laptop per uh -huh. child mm. to come up with this Magalhães program. Mm. program. And so I, 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 it is a very interesting concept. It's a very interesting approach to school connectivity in that it's been approach to various angles. Mm -hmm. So when we mention approaches, what are the different approaches that you covered on in the session, like the hybrid approach, the top-bottom approach, what are they? That's the approach in how to select the schools, because as we say, when we're looking mm -hmm. at large com countries, but today we had Brazil speaking, we had Egypt speaking. Yeah. These are large co countries, and if, when we talk about covering their schools or providing broadband to their schools, we're talking about a lot of money in a lot of schools. That's like the gentleman from Comoros mm -hmm. said, how do we small, poor countries finance the yes. provision of broadband to schools? So you do have to prioritize, um, or you do have to have an approach in which you say, this is the schools we'll cover initially, and this is the timing for the further coverage of schools. Mm -hmm. That can happen either by the government agency, mm -hmm. or you can have a scheme in which you say, okay, this is the school connectivity, let mm -hmm. schools apply for their connectivity. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the bottom-up approach in which it's the schools themselves that state their case for being a priority, mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than government imposing a particular priority. Mm -hmm. And a hybrid one? The hybrid one is a little bit of both, uh -huh. in which there is an approach, but you you still have applications from individual schools within a certain action plan uh -huh. that is specified. So what support do we need in, when we speak about school, uh, school connectivity uh, national plans? What kind of support is needed? Is it just monetary support or something else? As I say, what I w uh, the, the very first, uh, when we look at the various steps in which we um, define the school connectivity plans, mm. you need to look at your legal and regulatory framework. Mm. You need to uh, set the deadlines. You need to look what the best technology is within the f your framework, within your timelines. Mm. Uh, and then obviously you do need to figure it out, to, to price it out and see this is the funding that we would need for, for the school. Mm -hmm. So in my final question, how do you think school connectivity is related to other community issues? like disabilities and women's rights and other topics? As I said in, uh, previously, now in the interview, schools are seen as a safe, safe place. Mm. Schools are seen as community places, particularly when we're talking about public schools, because you saw from the session that most school connectivity projects connect the public schools mm. or the municipal schools. So they are often seen as public places or as places where community can have activities or as anchor, anchor, anchors for yeah. connectivity. And that's how I think when you have that um, connectivity into the schools, you can expand that connectivity to include other groups as well, uh -huh. groups with special needs. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.